So a couple of weeks ago, I posted on Twitter a tweet that basically called out how comedically desperate and hypocritical the Bulgarian responses are when we deal with the evidence of how Macedonians actually saw their origins, their heroes, and most importantly, what they saw as their fight for Macedonia. So I tweeted the following. Macedonians in the 1800s. Yes, I'm Macedonian Bulgarian. I consider Alexander the Great my ancestor, not Asparuch. I fight for the freedom of Macedonia, for the use of our local language, and against the Bulgarian extricates propaganda in Macedonia. In Bulgars today, see, he said Bulgarian. Now, most of you got right offhand what this tweet explored. But let's take some time now to delve a little bit deeper into what on earth a Macedonian Bulgarian actually was. This is probably going to be one of the most important videos you're going to see on Mario's History Talks. So before we get started, definitely take a moment to like, comment, and subscribe down below and have the notifications on as well for new videos as they come along. And also some other news, uh, some fans in Macedonia took the time to create a Discord server for Mario's History Talks, so check out the link down below as well. And without any further ado, let's get started. So let's start with the basics. This is going to be hard for some of you to swallow, but I promise you, you will be better off for it. The idea that the modern day Greek identity was formed in ancient times with Pedocles and Themistocles is 19th century romantic myth making. The idea that the Bulgarian identity was formed in the 9th and 10th century during Boris and Simeon's reign is 19th century romantic nationalist myth making. Similarly, the idea that the Macedonian identity was formed in the 800s with Karanis and Perdikas is also just that, 19th century romantic and nationalist myth making. Again, almost all modern day Balkan identities arose in the 1800s and were centered around nationalist myths stretching back to a glorious ancient past. Now, this is not to say that there's no connecting tissues between the modern people and the ancient tribes that once lived in that land. It's more so to say that what we understand to be Greek, Bulgarian, Serbian, and Macedonian today only arose in the 1800s. And despite what Bulgarian nationalists want you to believe, that the Bulgarianization of Macedonians occurred in the Middle Ages and lasted until 1944 and just vanished overnight, this is just wishful thinking. Now, as we reviewed in a previous video, Macedonia did not become Bulgarian because of the policies of Khan Boris. Far from it. Macedonia was a distant corner of the Bulgarian Empire, having only recently been incorporated into the kingdom, with more than two centuries of Slavic history before they were incorporated. The reason Macedonia became Bulgarian is largely because of the policies of the Byzantine Empire, Basil II, who, after his defeat of Samuel, reorganized the majority of his empire into the newly created theme of Bulgaria while Bulgaria proper was reorganized as a theme of Paristrium, as well as, ironically enough, the theme of Macedonia. Now, the reasons for naming it the theme of Bulgaria were many, and we touched on this in the previous videos, but surface level overview, they were mostly centered around the Byzantine Empire's desire to link the Ohrid Archbishopric Church, Samuel's Church, which it allowed to exist after Samuel's defeat, with the former Bulgarian Patriarchate, since this was a church that was actually sanctioned by the Byzantines themselves. And since Samuel's empire just essentially showed up after the Byzantines thought they had decisively defeated and captured the Bulgarian crown, and here comes Samuel with his own church and his own crown bestowed by the Vatican, the Byzantines, of course, would want to create the notion they had a hand in granting his legitimacy, even if it was taken by them, so they wanted to create the notion of ideological Byzantine supremacy in granting the Ohrid Archbishopric Church its legitimacy, since as God's representatives on earth, only they could bestow that privilege. Now, after this stage, and especially after the rise of the Hellenization of the Ohrid Archbishopric Church, which eventually led to its abolition in 1767, Greek-speaking patriarchists would refer to Macedonians as Vulgaroi or Vulgari, a term that not only denoted them as Slavic speakers, but also as uneducated and thick-headed peasantry. It was more so an insult. 
Now, this term was a relic of the Byzantine Empire's policies, as well as the Ohrid Archbishopric Church being labeled Ohrid Archbishopric of all Bulgaria. However, the reference to the Slavic speakers in Macedonia as Bulgarians did linger longer because of this historical precedent, even after the term had lost any national meaning and became more of an administrative identity. And we can be confident that this was not a national meaning. We can be pretty confident in making this bold claim. Before the theme of Bulgaria's existence, there are no references or inscriptions in Macedonia or of Macedonians self-identifying as Bulgarians. It only came about after the defeat of Samuel and the creation of the theme system. Afterwards, all inhabitants of the theme of Bulgaria, including Greeks, and by extension of the Ohrid Archbishopric's jurisdiction, which was considerably larger, all these people were considered Bulgarians by the Greeks. And their Slavic language, the people that spoke a Slavic language, that would have been called Bulgarian. This also included the Serbs, the Montenegrins, and the Bosnians. So again, Macedonians did not become any more ethnically Bulgarized because of the theme system nor Khan Boris's policies than the Serbs or Montenegrins would have been. What separated the Macedonians, however, in having that term preserved longer than the other nations was not only the theme of Bulgaria, but also their church, their national church, bearing that name as well, even if it came from political reasons. But what does this have to do with how the Macedonians of the early 1800s felt as their identity? Well, Bulgarians will be quick to point out that Macedonians who use the term Bulgarian clearly thought of themselves as part of a larger Bulgarian nation, the same one as today, in fact. And during this period, though, of course, in the rebirth of Macedonia and Bulgaria, there was obviously some sort of shared struggle between the Macedonians and Bulgarians, uh, both under the Ottoman yoke, both Slavic speakers, but both under heavy Hellenization pressures. As we discussed in previous videos, the first stage of this rebirth movement, both Macedonia and Bulgaria, was the dehonization of individuals like the Milodinov brothers, of course, and of course with the famous Grigor Parlichev as well. And following that dehonization, there was a promotion of broad Slavic literacy as well as a Slavic identity. And undoubtedly, the words Bulgar and Bulgarski were used during this time period to describe their identity as Slavs and non Greeks. This was partially due to the Russian pan Slavicist influence of, of individuals like Vanellen. But it also came out because it was the perfect way to contrast how the Greeks viewed themselves at this stage, Romayoi. So we have the Greek speaking Romayoi tracing their identity back to the Roman Empire, their legitimacy. And then we have the Slavic speaking Bulgaroi tracing their identity and their legitimacy back to the Slavic Bulgarian Empire. So Greeks were just as ethnically Roman because they were part of the Eastern Roman Empire as the Macedonians were ethnically Bulgarian. But the point here, though, of course, is the Bulgarian label came about in Macedonia from a combination of the historical precedent of the Ohrid Archbishop of Church and how the Greeks would refer to Macedonians because of that, but also because of their resistance to Hellenism as well. It was a loose semblance of an identity, at best denoting belonging to a separate, non-Greek, Slavic-speaking nation. And it's important to remember that for most Macedonians during this time period, the illiterate peasants even such basic concepts would have been alien to them. The only notion of identity they would have had would have been primarily regional, if not just religious. So let's take a moment now and look at some instances to see the, for the individuals making the claim that they were Macedonian Bulgarians, what exactly this might have meant to them. So we'll be taking a look at the early Macedonian enlighteners, as well as some other individuals and organizations you may know. So. We start, of course, with the Milodinov brothers. Now, we have a whole video about the Milodinov brothers, but let's go over some of the basics as a refresher. In one of his letters, Dimitar Milodinov stated that the inhabitants of Macedonia speak not Bulgarian, but Pelasgo Slavic. And he also considered them to be part of the Pelasgian ethnos. The Pelasgians, of course, being a mysterious Balkan people from antiquity that actually predated the Hellens in their arrival. And while in Greece, uh, Dimitar Milodinov also made a point to argue with the Greeks there that Alexander the Great and Philip were not Greeks, but they were Slav like he was. And in their actual anthology, which is, which is actually made up of more Macedonian folk songs than Bulgarian, we also see a clear distinction between the Macedonian kings and the Bulgarian kings. And of course, as you remember, we also have stories about 
Alexander the Great, part of the oral tradition of Macedonia during this time period. In other letters, they quite literally say, Nie Makedonchinata. And they also say, Makedonski Tepesni. But hey, they still called the work Bulgarian, as well as their national origin at times. So they may have called themselves Greek and wrote in Greek and actually had their name be listed as Milanides, but that doesn't count. Only the Bulgarian identity is valid here. Checkmate Antichki. What on earth could you say to that right now? <laughs> now, in the 1840s, one of the major Macedonian educators and enlighteners was Jordan Konstantinov Ginot. He, like many enlighteners of the day, referred to the Macedonians as Bulgarians as a simple fact, though at other points he also self-identified as Serbian, as well as the Macedonians as a Serbian people as well. But go figure. Now, when we switch back to the Bulgarian side, of course, he wrote numerous articles, books, essays on not only the need for a, a language to be codified that he called Bulgarian, but also on the history of the Macedonian Bulgarians to be taught as well. According to him, not only were modern Macedonian Bulgarians descendants of the ancient Macedonians and the Illyrians, but he also considered the following to be Bulgarians as well. Get ready for this. The Myrmidons of the Iliad, the ancient Macedonians, the Illyrians of course, Justinian the Great, Basil I and II, and even the Emperor Constantine the Great, who was born in modern day Serbia. So wow folks, just like the modern day Bulgarians do and say as well, game over Utidoist. He said Bulgarian, simple as that. And next of course we have here Grigor Prlichev, the famous Macedonian writer, teacher and translator in the early 1800s. Now, we'll do a whole video on Prlichev since his life is extremely interesting. But Prlichev, after having been declared the next Homer in Greece for his work uh, O Armartalos, um, he also saw disillusionment with Hellenism. But subsequently, he also adopted a Bulgaro Macedonian identity when he continued his work to promote Slavic literacy and language. And during the commemoration of the 1000th anniversary of the death of St. Methodius at the Bulgarian Men's High School in Solon, Prlichev gave the famous speech that we've already discussed before, talking about how shameful it is for Macedonians who once conquered the world through Alexander the Great and then enlightened the Slavs through the Saint Cyril and Methodius for them to be reduced down to this lowly estate than, that they've ever been in. So yes, this is the man that the Bulgarians claim as their own while calling us Antichki. But anyway, <laughs> this great Bulgarian patriot who just happened to think that Alexander the Great and ancient Macedonians were his ancestors and not the actual, you know, Bulgarians, also admitted in his autobiography that he never quite mastered the standard Bulgarian literary language, as was based off of a distant Eastern dialect, and as such, he was actually shunned by Bulgarian circles for speaking broken Bulgarian. Poor guy. But he said what he was, he said he was Bulgarian. What more do you need? It's all over for you, Macedonists. Can't you read? Now, at the same time as uh, Prlichev and the Mildinov brothers, we also have Kuzman Shepkarev. And uh, he was also a translator, an enlightener, and a teacher. Like many of his day, he oscillated between strong Macedonian nationalism to overt pan-Bulgarian nationalism as well. Nothing crazy here. Many Macedonians will switch between you know, Macedonian, Greek, Serbian, Bulgarian identities and loyalties, or even a confusing mix of all of them. And like the Milodinov brothers uh, and Grigor Prlichev, he initially espoused a strong Hellenic identity and wrote all of his letters in Greek, signed not by Kuzman Shepkarev, but Kosmas Paskali. And afterwards, he espoused both a strong Macedonian and Bulgarian identity that seemed to contradict each other at times. He was a strong proponent of Macedonian language textbooks being used in schools, not Bulgarian. And in fact, not only did he specifically differentiate between the Macedonian and Bulgarian languages at certain points, stating that uh, Bulgarian and the Bulgarian language is one thing, and a Macedonian, the Macedonian language is another thing, but he went as far as to encourage the residents of Vrissin to return copies of the Bulgarian textbooks they were handed since according to him, his students simply could not understand them. Now, Bulgarians in turn con considered his dialect that he wanted to you know, speak in dirty and vulgar and simply un-Bulgarian. And he wasn't too much of a fan of the actual Bulgarians themselves. 
He famously quipped, We just freed ourselves from the Greeks. Are we to become Shopi now? Shopi, of course, referring to how the Macedonians called the Bulgarians during this time period. In other instances, he also went head to head with the Greeks, debating in articles how the ancient Macedonians couldn't have possibly been Greeks. They could not have been Greeks because they were Macedonians, something he was especially passionate about, since he recalled in his childhood his father, direct quote here, telling us many tales, some of them about King Marco and others about Tsar Alexander, Alexander the Great. But remember folks, in other times he still called himself a great Bulgarian patriot, he called the Macedonians Makedonski de Bulgari, and as well as their language Bulgarian, and he actually wanted to compromise to include the Macedonian dialects inside of a standardized Bulgarian language. So you can ignore all that gray area and you know contradiction from before. That stuff doesn't matter whatsoever. He clearly said Bulgarian. That's all that matters here, you Serbian communist. The man said Bulgarian. And then in 1867, of course, we have the Macedonian writer, educator, and enlightener, Dimitar Makedonski. And one of his uh, textbooks that he worked on and distributed throughout Macedonia in a Socratic question and answer style format and being asked about the identity of the modern day Bulgarians of Macedonia, it stated that they were, the Bulgarians, actually baptized to Christianity by St. Paul in the biblical era, centuries before the Bulgarians ever stepped foot on the Balkans. Weird how this learned intellectual could somehow completely gloss over the fact that the Bulgarians were not even there yet when publishing a textbook. But hey, you know what folks, that's just all a distraction. This man, he said Bulgarian. Case closed. And next, of course, we have Isaiah Majovsky, a Macedonian national revivalist, political agitator, missionary, and who was a supporter of the idea of an autonomous Macedonia within a South Slavic community. Majovsky considered the Macedonians to be Bulgaro Slavs. Yet he considered these Bulgarians to have been descendants from the ancient Macedonians specifically over 2,500 years ago when King Karanis brought them into the Balkans. Now, in other instances, we have in his memoirs the story of a Jewish man being invited to his uncle's house for dinner, which ended with them singing songs, not about Alexander the Great like we all can, but about King Karanis himself, the obscure first king of Macedonia, whose scholars even doubt was even real, as well as the Princess Thessalonica. The Jewish man, of course, was amazed at this, and he asked them, how was it they knew of such people going back centuries? And their brothers replied, direct quote here from Majovsky's uh, memoir. These were songs from the olden times, passed down from father to son. They were sung by our fathers and grandfathers, and we learned to sing these songs from them. But you know what? You can just disregard all that, folks. The man clearly said what he was. I mean, he said he, as well as the Macedonians, wore Bulgaro Slavs. <laughs> Your common turn tricks are just not gonna work here, you pseudo Makedonskis. Not on this channel. And now, moving right along here, we have, of course, the Ilnian period. And we have the famous interview Nikola Kadev gave to the Greek newspaper Acropolis, where he stated that not only was the Macedonian revolutionary org not Bulgarian, but he himself felt only Macedonian, and a direct descendant of Alexander the Great at that. However, Wikipedia is quick to remind us this can't be true, since he was actually a Bulgarian. His brother clearly testifies to the fact that they were born to a Bulgarian family, so by extension, kind of, he had to have been Bulgarian. You hear that, you commies? He said, Bulgarian! I mean, disregard the rest, you falsifiers of history. Let's just jump ahead here slightly here with everybody's favorite pro-Bulgarian organization, MPO. Yes, MPO, the organization that has been hijacked by Mikhailov and the Bulgarian interest groups and that has largely been as useful as a dumpster fire today. Though some of their more active members, and we all know who this refers to, do provide us some countless laughs online. So let's look at how this group actually saw themselves and their heritage at various points. Out of all the chapters they established in the United States, absolutely none of them referred to any actual Bulgarians. And even though this group still used the Bulgarian label to describe themselves, this didn't matter. In fact, they even had a chapter named after, you guessed it, Alexander the Great in Lorraine, Ohio. 
And furthermore, in MPO's Articles of Incorporation from 1925, they define their purpose as follows. For the mutual assistance and protection of people of the Macedonian race, and for the liberation of Macedonia from political entities, to foster the ancient right of Macedonia as a state and a nation. Ancient? Nation? Hmm. But then again, you're also going to see photos like this of MPO members waving Bulgarian flags too, right? So what does it all mean? Well, let's take a look and see what they thought their ancestry actually constituted. We have a 1934 article from the Macedonian Tribune entitled, Is there a relationship between the Macedonians of Alexander the Great and modern Bulgarians? The author here suggests that the Macedonians, the ancient Macedonians, they survived the Roman conquest and they actually amalgamated with the so-called Bulgarian Slavs and many of their physical and spiritual traits survive in the modern day Macedonian population as well. Ugh, man, get a load of these Antichki, crazies. <sighs> but anyway, back to reality folks. What am I trying to show you with these examples throughout history? What does it all mean when you put it all together? Well, we see how the Bulgarian name only came to be incorporated in Macedonia, not because of anything the actual Bulgarians did, but because of the policies of the Byzantine Empire. Macedonia never truly became Bulgarized like the people in Mesia and Thrace did. If they did, we would not be having this debate today. There would be no need for Marius history talks. And Petko Slavikov wouldn't have been complaining to the Exarch Joseph in the 1870s about the threat that Macedonianism poses to Bulgarian interests. From the very beginning, this label would have been a loose identity imposed on the Macedonians on the account of the theme of Bulgaria and the Ohid Archbishopric Church being called Bulgarian for political legitimacy. As well as, of course, the attitude of the Greek patriarchists thoughtlessly calling all Slavic peasants along their border Volgaroi. And by the time of the National Reawakening, this term did come back, but this time not as an insult, but rather a form of reclamation and resistance against Hellenism, and of course coming from the need to identify themselves as a separate people, but with the legitimate empire and church backing their existence in the Middle Ages. For the Greeks, it was of course the Byzantine or the Roman Empire. For the Macedonians, it would have been Tsar Samuel's empire and Tsar Samuel's church, the Ohrid Archbishopric, and by which point both of these things would have been long remembered in history as Bulgarian. But even then, we find this was a very fluid and seemingly mind-boggling choice of words for these people to describe themselves. I mean, these were folks that claimed that their descent was from antiquity, mostly from, get this, ancient Macedonians. And to them, there was no contradiction with calling themselves Bulgarians, but still harking back to an ancient glorious past and not the past of when the Bulgarians first came to the Balkans, but to the time of Alexander the Great and other ancient tribes. So what we're seeing here is that although most, if not all, early Macedonian enlighteners clearly identified as Macedonian Bulgarians, some more than others, but if we actually read what these individuals thought constituted their identity, what they said about themselves, we arrive at two conclusions. One being that the people today, the Bulgarians, who claimed them as their own, but who actually would take the time to read their words and their ideas, they would undoubtedly be relentlessly mocking them as Antichki and Macedonists. The same exact people that are trying to prove their Bulgarianists online would be calling these folks Antichki. Their only saving grace, these people is, wait for it, they said they were Bulgarian. <laughs> Honestly, how absolutely embarrassing for them that this is what they have to cling to to be able to sleep at night. And two, the Bulgarian label simply could not contain what was developing in Macedonia and within the embryonic Macedonian early identity. Strong regionalism, different heroes, different culture, different spoken language. From the very beginning, the Macedonian identity was starting to break down what defined a Bulgarian and what defines a Bulgarian even today. Separation from these two people was inevitable, as even as early as the 1800s. No communism, no bloody Christmas, no Serbia, no Tito were needed to create a reality that was already brewing centuries ago. And while Macedonians used the Bulgarian identity out of convenience, it simply outlived its usefulness for them. And as a people, they simply tossed it aside when it no longer served its purpose. And as the historian Detries states um, in his book, The Concise History of Bulgaria, um, in Macedonian identity, by the time it was officially recognized, the overwhelming majority of Macedonians 
had no problem adapting this new identity, which for many of them wasn't new at all. So folks, with that, we are wrapping up today's episode of Mario's History Talks. I do hope you enjoyed it. The one thing I want you to walk away with is we can no longer just turn the other way when we see the word Bulgarian being used in history. Bulgarians want to pounce on us, showing us all the ways it was used, but when we actually take a look at it, when we actually look at it with context, with perspective, we actually identify the ambiguity like historians ought to, we see it as nothing more than a house of cards ready to tumble whenever we actually probe into it. And that's our job now. We can no longer be running away from it. Something we have to embrace, something we have to identify, but more importantly, something we have to explain as part of our identity. It's not what the Bulgarians said. Like I said, our history may be uncomfortable for a lot of people, but the facts are still on our side. As we saw in this video, there are a lot of things I said that made you uncomfortable, but also flat out contradict what the Bulgarians say about our identity and who we are. So folks, keep researching, rewatch this video, reach out to me if you have any kind of questions, of course. This is the fight we need to keep going. You know what's happening in Macedonia. We cannot let down one bit. So I'm going to get to work, of course, on the next video here. I want you to stay in touch with me. I am on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and as of recently, I'm on Discord, though I'm still learning how to use that. So definitely stay in touch with me there. Um, I'll see you again soon. I get to work on the next episode here. So in the meantime, stay safe and keep fighting. This is Micah Macedonia. Till next time, folks. Take care.